Well, good morning. Uh, on behalf of the Wilson Center and the Brazil Institute, I am Paulo Sotero, the Institute's director, and I'm very happy to be here this morning uh, with, for the session with Dr. John Hemming on his latest book, uh, Naturalists Par in Paradise. Uh, it's about an expedition that started some 160 years ago by the three pioneers of the studies of the Amazon region, scientists. And uh, it's a great honor, great pleasure to have uh, Dr. Hemming here with us this morning. This uh, discussion, this book presentation, uh, is happening under the auspices of a series we have at the Wilson Center, which is the Managing Our Planet series, brought to us by our dear friend, Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, member of our advisory board here at the Brazil Institute. And uh, we have run this series for more than three years now in partnership with George Mason University and the environmental program here in, uh, at the Wilson Center. Now, two notes that I wanted to share with you. Uh, you know, those three, Wallace, Bates, and Spruce, started this adventure 160 years ago. Uh, Dr. Hemming himself continued the adventure because he is one of the explorers of the Amazon. And we have another one here, which is Tom. And Tom is celebrating this year 50 years of work in the Amazon. Uh, and we, this will be marked in a variety of, of ways, uh, one of them being uh, by the Wilson Center, by the Brazil Institute, and now it can be announced that next month we are going to uh, present to Tom Lovejoy the Woodrow, Wilson, the, the Woodrow Wilson Award on Public Service at the ceremony in New York. Uh, also honored will be uh, André Esteves, an investment banker from Brazil to, who has invested uh, millions of his private money into sustainability projects and issues. Uh, uh, the other uh, note is that the following month in November, National Geographic will have a special edition, will publish a new map of the Amazon uh, with uh, really uh, showing the rich biodiversity of the region that I think concentrates the largest proportion of biodiversity in any part of the, uh, the world. Uh, and uh, that map is a result of Tom's work, dedication, uh, and uh, uh, we are very happy that this is uh, happening. Uh, so wait for your November issue of National Geographic or go and buy it and <laughs> give it. It's, it's November, so Christmas is the following month. <laughs> Here's an idea for a gift. And uh, so it is uh, my pleasure to uh, uh, be here this morning. Uh, I will ask uh, with you guys, and I think more people will come, will arrive, but uh, uh, it, to properly present uh, Dr. Hemming, I would like to uh, give the floor to our dear friend, Tom Lovejoy. Tom, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Paolo, and especially thank you to the Brazil Institute uh, for sponsoring this session this morning. Uh, I believe in very short introductions because people come to hear the speaker and you actually have a bio that was uh, outside. Uh, but uh, let me say this about uh, John Hemming, uh, a good friend for a very long time. Uh, John comes out of an extraordinary British tradition of exploration and scholarship. Uh, and the three naturalists who are featured in his latest book uh, were exactly that, although they did not have the advantages of formal education 
uh, as John has or I have. Uh, but basically, John Hemming's heart beats like an explorer's heart. <laughs> uh, and at the same time, he has a, a streak of really admirable scholarship. And so this book is just the latest in a series uh, over time that explore these themes of exploration and science uh, and nature in a properly proper scholarly way uh, and uh, includes red gold uh, about Brazilian indigenous peoples uh, and their challenges and their history uh, and their culture. Uh, but I'm beginning to go on too long. <laughs> so uh, let me just say, when I heard about this book, I said, of course, that book has been crying out to be written uh, for decades. And who better to do it than John Hemming. John. Thank you. I'm um, going to go over to the well, side so I can see your PowerPoint. Oh, thanks. I'm just going to get this. Uh, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, I said, Tom gave a, a nice, very nice dinner for me last night. And I think he must be one of the very few people who could have had spread out on the table first editions <laughs> of Wallace, Bates, and Spruce. <laughs> that, that was quite a valuable. Uh, greeting for me last night. I, I think I'll, I'll, I'll just <laughs> stay seated if that's all right. <laughs> well, this is the cover of my new book. And uh, on the left, uh, Alfred Russell Wallace. In the center, Henry Walter Bates. And on the right, Richard Spruce. Uh, these three ha had much in common. They were what we'd call in England lower middle class. They, they each, their families were each of them too poor to keep them in school after the ages of 13 or in one, one case 14. Each had to be hauled out of school and, and become an apprentice. But they were um, working pretty long hours uh, as apprentices. But they each in individually, uh, they were also provincial kids. Uh, they, they were one, uh, Wallace was born in Wales. Uh, um, Bates in Leicester and <laughs> Spruce in Yorkshire. Uh, but they each became in incredible autodidacts. They, in the few hours left uh, uh, in their working day, they, they read their way through just about everything that they could lay their hands on. But even more importantly, they each became passionate about natural history. And that, that's why we're talking about them today. Um, the Bates and Wallace they had met in, in Leicester. I think we, we think they bumped into each other in the public library. And then they went out on Sundays uh, bug hunting in the forest around Leicester. <coughs> Butterflies and beetles. And Wallace then in his um, sort of apprenticeship was working with his older brother uh, doing jobbing um, land surveying wherever they could get a bit of work. Uh, but in, in so he tramped around a lot of southern England and Wales, <coughs> and, and he, he got to know birds and uh, uh, wildflowers extremely well. Uh, again, taught himself. So in, in 1848, uh, <coughs> the two of them had s decided on at very short notice uh, that they go and try their luck in the Amazon. They'd read a book about the Amazon by an American called Edwards, a young, young chap, uh, who said how, how wonderfully luxuriant the forests were. Uh, but he also said that life in the Amazon is extraordinarily cheap. And that, that, that phrase caught their eye. <laughs> so uh, off they, they went down to London and met the people at Natural History Museum and at Kew and <laughs> got a few pointers on uh, collecting and mounting the specimens. And um, they, all they had in those days uh, to catch insects was butterfly nets. There was no mist fogging or uh, light, light traps. <laughs> and um, then they had a, a stroke of very good luck. They, they got themselves a marvelous agent, 
an agent made in heaven. <laughs> Most agents are in love with light. But the, he, this, the, the man they got was terrific, as, as you will hear. And then they got passage. There was very little movement between the, the Amazon and Europe in those days because there was practically no commercial product coming out of the Amazon. This is long before the rubber boom. But there was a, a little tubby sailing boat was making the run. So they got a passage on that. They, they were the only passengers sit, sitting on the cargo. They, they took the ship in, in Liverpool, but um, they were too poor to go up in the, in the stagecoach. They had to sit up on the roof all night. Anyway, off they went, and they got to, to Brazil. Oh, oh, one other thing, in, in those, those few months when they were deciding on this big career move, because they had no dependency, they were y young youngsters and, and what. Um, but uh, Bates late, later recalled that um, they'd also gone out with, with a scientific purpose. He quote from Bates, he said that we went to, to gather facts, as Mr. Wallace expressed it in one of his letters to me, quote, towards solving the problem of the origin of species, a subject in which we had conversed and corresponded much together. It was quite a big topic at that moment because well, uh, the whole, whole early part of the 19th century, the, the, the big debate on the, uh, the Bible versus the uh, um, much earlier origin of species. Um, and then w when they got there and saw the, the, the wonderful uh, wildlife, of course, they, they instantly started collecting and sending back consignments. But Bates wrote to his brother, uh, the, the charm and glory of the country are its animal and vegetable productions. How inexhaustible is their study. It is one dense jungle, a lofty forest of trees, a vast variety of species, all lashed and connected by climbers, their trunks covered with a museum of ferns, tilandrias, arums, orchids, etc. The underwood consists mostly of younger trees, great variety of small palms, mimosas, tree ferns, etc. He goes on and on like this. Then he says, it, it is a region which may fittingly be called a naturalist paradise. Well, that, of course, is where I got, got my title. Um, the Amazon at that, that time was, I think, probably as thinly populated as it's ever been in the last thousand years. Because all the great chieftains seen by Oriana in the 16th century had long since been uh, eradicated by disease and enslavement and or fleeing from the main rivers. Then the, uh, at the end of the colonial era, the, the missionaries had all been expelled, the Jesuits and the Franciscans. And, and then just a, a decade before uh, the two arrived, in the late, late 1830s, had been the the biggest social rebellion in Brazilian history, the Cabanagem, where the oppressed underclasses of, of Indians and, and blacks, uh, who n normally rather disliked one another, but they got together and tried to shake off their oppressors. So that, that added a, about a, another 30,000 deaths to this already very, very thinly populated area. So. Um, Oh, Bates and Wallace spent only a few months together. They went together up the lower Tocantins. But um, then they decided to part. Uh, it wasn't an acrimonious parting. Uh, I think it was just that it's quite difficult for two people to collect together. Because uh, if one finds something nice, they, especially as they were each trying to live off selling their collections. And uh, also, they. I think e even more so, they, they were very different characters, as, as we shall see. So anyway, they decided to go their own ways. Now, movement in the Amazon then was, was very, very difficult because almost there was absolutely no public service. There was no roads. Uh, movement was entirely by river. And the only propulsion on rivers was, was either sails, if you had a following wind, or Indian paddlers and Indians as a result of what I've just been saying, we're in very short supply. <laughs> there was no way a, a young, young Englishman could have a, get a boat of their own. <laughs> so they had to sort of catch lifts on 
because there was very few trading vessels. Uh, and there were few trading vessels because there was so little commercial produce coming out of the Amazon. But they, they each managed to find things. And, but against that, there was a, was an, a nice atmosphere of hospitality in this very, very thinly populated region. I mean, if, if a boat came, uh, obviously the, the people on board could sling their hammocks and be fed by whoever was on the riverbank who was only too pleased to see a, a stranger. So they very rarely had to pay for anything on their travels. But um, sometimes we, we, when the, as I'm sure we all know, the, the Amazon had current is terrifically powerful. And uh, normally the, the winds are easterly and dry, driving ships up, up against the current. But at times the wind drops, and then, then they were quite literally hauling boats from tree to tree. They'd send a little uh, Monteria ahead, get a rope round a tree, haul. And, uh, so you can imagine how long that took. Uh, it could take half a year to get from Belém to Manaus. At other times, in the uh, upper Amazon, the Solimoys, the, uh, in the spring, the, the rivers flood a huge area on either side, the Vazia, and then you're moving through flooded forests like this. <laughs> but only an Indian could find his way through this labyrinth. And uh, at least you didn't have the current to, to contend with, but, but you, you very rarely had any bit of dry land on which to cook your food. So, and it was, it was slow. Now, just to say a few words about each of the three of them. This is Henry Walter Bates. He was much, most professional of the three in the sense that he, he, his, his, he was there to collect, and uh, that's what he did. Um, this is a big picture he drew, drew himself. Uh, the photography was in its infancy in the late 1840s, and even and certainly there was no field photography. And even if there had been cameras available, these guys were far too poor to have afforded to have one. So they had to draw their own and describe their specimens, even down to the coloration. Uh, this is a, a picture of Bates did of himself. He collected a, a curl crested toucan, he shot it, and, but it, it wasn't dead, it was still shrieking. And suddenly, out of the forest vegetation, he was mauled by uh, dozens of other curl crested toucans. Uh, he, he looks to me like Woody Allen. And, uh, this is sort of Woody Allen meets uh, Hitchcock to the bird, this, this picture. <laughs> but, um, but as I say, he, he was a, a really professional collector. And what he did was to, to base himself. Oh, this is. Uh, they were already. They immediately started sending back uh, collections as fast as they could. Mm, quite soon, um, their agent, Samuel Stevens, uh, got this butterfly named after Bates. This is, uh, I've forgotten his name. <laughs> anyway, it's Batesy. I. But um, Stevens also did a very smart thing. It, uh, all their, each consignment, they'd send a letter with it to him, and he immediately got these published in, in a new journal called the Zoologist. And all, all unedited, they had some personal remarks to him. They all went straight into print. And, and with some fairly flagrant ag advertising, <laughs> you know, he'd, he'd say, like, the, the, these enterprising young men have just sent back a wonderful consignment of butterflies. It, it contains a list of them. Anyway, he, he, Stephen sold everything. He met. They, they, they were lucky in one sense. In, in the middle of the 19th century, before philately and other things, it, it was quite common to, for an English gentleman to ha have a cabinet of uh, natural history curiosities. So there were collectors then, which there, there wouldn't have been later in that century. Um, so Bates was every day, uh, he, he'd get up at dawn at 6 a.m., because we're, we're right on the equator here, as you know. And uh, he was the, the, the f first hour or two, he'd be out collecting mostly birds and animals. Then he'd come back for a cup of coffee, which was his one luxury the, the three of them 
had out in the Kajan Kashasa. Um, and then he'd go out again late morning, mostly for insects. And in the afternoon, he'd, he'd spend most of it writing up and, and, and uh, mounting his specimens. And of course, there was no lighting to speak of. He, he'd, he'd, he'd based himself over the coming years in, in different, uh, like he spent a year, or more than a year in Santa Rea, and then he spent many months in Manaus, and particularly in Ega, now known as Tefe, sort of midway between Manaus and the Peruvian frontier. So it's that was the, the, his professionalism, rather the way he'd been in Leicester, uh, living in a town and going out every day and collecting round about it. Um, and he, he, after a few years, he started thinking it was time he went back, but he, he never did. He, he stayed on and on and on, and in the end, spent 11 years in the Amazon, always up and down the main mainstream, but out collecting every single day. You know, I, I don't think he ever took a day off because. I mean, you know, there, was, there were no nightclubs or golf courses or anything. <laughs> there was nothing much to do with his leisure time other than what he loved, which was collecting. And in those 11 years, he collected a just short of 15,000, 14,800 something species. I mean, specimens, or like many, many times that. And of those nearly 15,000 species, they, they were animals, birds, uh, reptiles, uh, mollusks, uh, fish, but the vast majority, of course, were, were insects. Because at her heart, Bates was an entomologist, that was his biggest love. This is a picture he, you know, of, he noticed that one, oh, he, as well as his collecting, which was his sole means of income, and, and we're talking pennies. I mean, they, they got five pence for a morpho for the most glamorous butterfly, and l much less than that for beetles. Um, but he, they, he, and and the other two boasted an enormous amount of disinterested scientific research. And I say disinterested because they had no hope of an academic preferment from this, uh, and nor could they get any money. Uh, Bates, for instance, spent several months doing an intensive study of termites. He, all the different types of termite hill and what went on in them and all the different types of termite. <coughs> because you can't sell a termite to a collector. So there was no, nothing in it for him, but just pure intellectual curiosity. And he noticed that one species of butterfly, Thomidae, were gliding through the forest and very rarely predated. In, in this picture, the, the second row are Ithomidae and the bottom one. The other butterflies in this picture, uh, uh, the, the reason the, the uh, Ithomidae were, were not predated was they have a rather nasty little yellow secretion at the end of their thorax. When, when you mounted them, you got your, this on your fingers. And that was fairly poisonous or certainly inedible. The others in this, the first row and the third and fourth, didn't have that secretion and were highly edible. But their only survival strategy was to get through life by imitating the poisonous ones. And look over the evolution, how, how incredibly well they imitated. The s shape of the wing, the coloration, the marking. Um, this is uh, evolution. That is that phenomenon is known to this day as Batesian mimicry, named after him. He also uh, he had a few friends, mostly, funnily enough, not not with young, but with more middle-aged uh, Brazilians. His best friend was uh, this uh, Antonio Caruso, the one with. Um, who is was up in when he was in Tefe, <laughs> and uh, Cardozo took him out to see the, the one, one of the few really big uh, collective activities in the Amazon, mm -hmm. 
which was a turtle egg hunt and turtle hunt. This, this actually was, it was the, the biggest environmental um, catastrophe of, of the 19th century. Other than that, with so few people living in the Amazon, environmental damage was non-existent. No, nobody had, had any need or desire to fell forests. But freshwater turtles were the one great exception. E even Humboldt, who was there in the year 1800, had been shocked by the, the degree of collecting. He, he reckoned that there were 40 million turtle eggs a year being collected in the Amazon for, for cooking and for and in the, in the later in the rubber boom for lighting chandeliers. <laughs> anyway, he, he, Cardozo took, took Bates out on this and uh, highly organized. All, all the riverbank people from a, hu a huge area of Amazonia assembled up at the banks where the turtles laid their eggs. Um, <coughs> this was a little <coughs> scene. They, they had their little camp on, <coughs> on a sandbank. And one night, a, a black caiman came waddling up. <coughs> and it was probably going to try and e eat Cardozo's pet dog, who was barking away there. Anyway, they, they, there's Bates waking up in his hammock, looking. Uh, you know, obviously, there's not, not many barbers around, so he had a lo lot of hair. <laughs> um, but that, that's the way he looked. Uh, they, they, they drove the caiman off with a, l a few logs from the fire. Uh, that, that was the turtle egg hunt, which was highly organized. Uh, each family was, was given a, s a patch of the, of the sandbank, and then at a given moment, they all started digging. And then the digging went on for about a week. Uh, that's how they got their millions of eggs, but, but endangered uh, those freshwater turtles. There are four, four species of them. Um, and now almost all pretty endangered. <coughs> this was <coughs> then um, <coughs> Cardozo knew of a, a, a little lagoon where there were also a lot of um, live turtles to be had. It was quite a secret location. He, he, you had to go through a bit of the forest to find it. <coughs> anyway, he, he and <coughs> there's Cardozo in the background standing, in the and the, his Indians, <coughs> the Mirano, or Witoto, or Bora. They, they'd got a big net and netted this pond. They were allowed to start by shooting, because uh, um, you'd probably know the, the well, sort of party trick of these Indians was to, to, to shoot into the air, because the weakest part of a uh, freshwater turtle's shell is, is in the middle. And they could shoot up, and it came down like a, a V2 rocket into the middle of the back. But uh, they were allowed to do that for a few for about half an hour, just f just for fun, but then then they started uh, closing their net, and um, you can see all the little turtle uh, faces peeking up, and they're they're flipping them into into Cardozo's canoe at the back there, and then they they found they they netted a a, a black caiman, and they're they're all laughing because they thought thought that was great great fun. Uh, Bates is standing there with a ready, r ready to whack it with a with a stick. I mean, he's not the greatest artist, so he, his his depiction of s smiling and laughing was not not, not that good. <coughs> but uh, as I say, the, the, there was much much more than that. He he did uh, animal behavior studies of, of an enormous range of uh, bird species and insect species. Um, and in his 11 years, yeah, I, I, I said, told you he collected um, nearly 15,000 species, of, of which 8,000 were new to science. And I mean, think of that. Uh, uh, Tom knows this, and that, well, we all know. I mean, to get one species new to science is, by definition, it's quite remote and hard to find and hard to catch. Uh, and above all, you've got to know it's new. You, you got it. But um, need to say, I mean, Bates was becoming a really extraordinarily uh, proficient uh, entomologist, and, and but 8,000 is quite a haul. And he, he rather modestly said, but uh, 
the reason it's such a high number is because I was the first to be working in these areas. <coughs> now here's Alfred Russell Wallace, uh, a very different character, much more um, uh, outward looking. At he, I, I think of him as an intellectual tourist. He, he, I mean, if he heard of something interesting, off he'd go. He didn't mind how tough it was. And boom, around the mouth of the Amazon, he, and he was interested in everything. He, uh, he had theories about everything. Some of them were, were spot on, others were not, but at least he had them. <coughs> he went rushing off to try and see a, a, a tidal bore on, on the Wama River. Then he, um, w within a few weeks of arriving in, in, in South America, he, uh, it's, it's just to remind you, of, and not that this, this audience needs reminding, but you know, Marajo over on the right is the size of Switzerland, and <coughs> the state of Amapá north of the mouth of the Amazon is the size of Great Britain. <coughs> So Bates moving back and forth on the main Amazon was covering hundreds of miles. <coughs> Wallace, on the other hand, went, <coughs> went right up the Rio Negro uh, above the big rapids at, at San Gabriel <coughs> and then up the Waupes, the, the big river that comes in. You see the, the, the dog's head, the northwest corner of Brazil is like a barking dog. <coughs> and uh, so that, that's the Waupes, Waupes River entering from Colombia. And then Wallace went right up to the, into Venezuela, into the headwaters of the Rio Negro. Um, but he, as I say, he, he, uh, when he was in, in um, Santa Elena, he heard that at near Monte Alegre uh, on the lower Amazon, um, there was some indigenous rock paintings. So he somehow got hold of a boat and got there and, and had a very tough little journey, you know, some r really tough stuff, and got to see them. And uh, this, this is Pedro Pintada, where Anna Roosevelt has done her, her wonderful work, but, but he was the first to, 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 and it was just tourism, and he just wanted to see these, these things. And then he, he correctly guessed that they had Orbidos, so the, the narrows on, so that it was sandstone, uh, that, that's the, southeastern extremity of the Guyana Shield, and he, he got, and then he had, he had theories about black water rivers versus white water, which were n not, not far off. Uh, he, he realized it was tannin. And, um, but then, and then he was also very interested in distribution of, of animal species. Um, it, later in life, he, he he's sometimes known as the father of biogeography. He noticed that oh, obviously insects are all over the place, but with some animals they, they couldn't cross ev even a, a, a medium-sized river. And so they, they evolved rather differently on either bank. So uh, th this was the, scene, you know, the beautiful scene of uh, an Amazonian river bank. But even in, the, in a lovely calm day like that, you can have a sudden storm so they all had near shipwrecks and <coughs> adventures. <coughs> but, uh, but above all, of course, he was collecting. And if Wallace heard there was some rare bird, off he went. Uh, and he, he wa really wanted to get a cock of the rock, a Katinga, <coughs> with uh, this lovely orangey plumage. And to get it, he, 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 this is when he was already midway up the Rio Negro. He went up the Asano a bit way, and then a, a river called the Kubate, right up to its head. And he, he got some uh, local, um, I think, Tariana Indians to help him. <laughs> and again, it was a, a little tough, seriously tough, because he, he was in the Kubate Hills, where it was dense forest, and but with jagged rock, and so they all had to climb down. Anyway, he got a, a dozen of these, <laughs> and then th is th there's an almost innumerable species that he went off trying to find like this, a, a black umbrella bird. He spent several weeks trying to get that. <coughs> they were, all of them, uh, very modest. Um, I mean, like with the black umbrella bird, um, Wallace, they always gave credit to one of their collectors. Uh, they, unlike most um, modern people, they didn't try to 
grab all the credit for themselves. I mean, he, he admitted with a black umbrella, but he could never have seen it. It was only one of his Indians knew which, which was right up in the tops of trees, and there was only an Indian who could have got it with his, with his Sarabatana. This is a, a little drawing uh, Wallace did, a sort of a, a fantasy drawing of some of the main bird species he collected. Uh, that's the umbrella bird, uh, uh, front left, because it, it's feathered at the top. It said it can spread them like a little umbrella. And then it has this very tassel down. Mm. They, they also, uh, they, they had a lot of trouble collecting and mounting their specimens because uh, they, they had to learn to be good taxidermists. Uh, and all of them, when they were collecting uh, insects, because they had n no light to speak of, so they had to do it in daylight. <laughs> and they were competing against, we're, we're in the richest terrestrial ecosystem in the world. And so they were competing against every rodent and bird and uh, insect to trying to gobble up their specimen before they could mount it and send it off. Uh, the, flying towards it is a carl crested toucan, the same that that Bates was being mobbed by. Um, over on, on the right are some hummingbirds, uh, and there's a jaguar. Yeah, that was a, it was a little fantasy of some of the birds. Mm -hmm. he, he got very interested in freshwater fish. Again, uh, well, I think the first person to seriously be interested in them mm -hmm. Uh, the Amazon has half the world's species of fresh, freshwater fish, as I'm sure you know. Uh, and Wallace in his, uh, he, he was, as I said, an apprentice land surveyor, so he was a very good draftsman and, and he could, could paint rather beautifully. But he could r very rarely send a specimen of, of one of these fish for the simple reason that on their travels they were always starving. And if the Indians had caught a fish, it was just time for Wallace to paint it. Or it, it had to go into the cooking pot, or you'd have had a, a, a mutiny on his hands. <laughs> then uh, on the, when he got up the wild pillars, above the Ipanare Rapids, he had already gone up the, the big rapids at, at San Gabriel. As, a, as you all know, the, the main Amazon, and the, the low, all the thousand kilometers of the lower Rio Negro, there's no rapids at all, the river is, is so enormous and so deep. <coughs> but after that, <coughs> when you get up near the headwaters, the rapids come thick and fast. <coughs> anyway, ab above the Panoré Rapids, uh, around Yamarete, he, he found himself <coughs> in the midst of, of a whole cluster of uh, mostly Tucano-speaking, but some Arawak-speaking, peoples who, who were in all the glory of their indigenous cultures. <coughs> and I think he, he was he, the first to see this, first foreigner, because uh, other for, for, no foreigner was allowed into the Amazon before 1820, when Spix and Martius were. <coughs> and mostly the foreigners just saw detribalized Indians as their canoe paddlers or li living in little isolated huts. But Wallace suddenly found himself in the midst of these magnificent tribes. <coughs> and he was bowled over. He, he said he never had an experience like it. He was transported into another world by the... Their, their cultures revolved around these great uh, communal huts, malocas, which are rather like early Christian basilicas. <coughs> and um, <coughs> then um, Wallace and later Spruce did some really very competent anthropological work. Um, again, disinterested, there was no money in it for him. And there was nothing to guide him, because anthropology as a discipline had really only started in the 1840s. And th although these guys had read just about everything they could lay their hands on, I don't think they could have read any anthropological work. But he did a, a very fine study. <coughs> He realized he had he described the whole life cycle, birth, puberty, marriage, death, and, and then some of the uh, ceremonies. And he was just enchanted by the, the beauty of these people and, and of their decoration and, and their way of life. 
Then he did, um, he, he drew and, and described 68 uh, 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 objects of the artifacts in their <coughs> daily lives from food gathering and hunting, fishing, and, and uh, cooking, <coughs> described those. And <coughs> then he did, he did little biblio, uh, little um, word counts of, of eight different indigenous dialects. Um, so it's quite impressive for a completely untrained person to just realize what, what anthropology, what was needed. Well, that's one where you're drawing of some of the artifacts, not, not to scale, but top left is a, a manioc grater and then a comb on top right, uh, and a, a pan for roasting manioc. Oh, in the in the middle is a cigar holder, because uh, their scars were just r rolled up uh, <laughs> leaves, uh, <coughs> which were too hot to hold, and a maraca maraca rattle. <coughs> then uh, he also and and also Spruce later became interested in in rock art, in, in petroglyphs. Uh, and again, this is pretty pioneering. I mean, now it's a major branch of Amazonian archaeology, but th these were the first to, to take it seriously. And th this is obviously an e easy one to interpret, but uh, others were much more difficult, and they tried to get their Indians to tell them what they thought the different designs represented. Uh, he had a very bad attack of malaria, but he, when he was recovering from it, he he thought, he, rather than just lying in his hammock feeling sorry for himself, he. he up. He, he'd heard about two exotic species, <coughs> something called a painted turtle, and a white version of the umbrella bird. I think, in fact, neither of these actually existed, but he, anyway, being Wallace, off he went and tried to get them. And they, they were thought to be deep in Colombia. So he went in, in that picture of the dog's head, the mouth of the dog is, is the Walpis. Wa called Valpes in Colombia. Um, so he went up that, uh, Yawarete is, is the e end of the mouth. But that, that journey involved 57 rapids. So his Indians had to haul him up and then later bring him down all these rapids. <coughs> he didn't have any surveying instruments to speak of. I think he'd broken, he had a sextant, he'd broken that and he lost some things. He was always having shipwrecks, and, uh, and <coughs> but he made a, a very competent map <coughs> of that upper part of the Waupes, uh, which was still the, still the best map right up into the 20th century. But that was his uh, land surveying training. Um, Wallace left after three, uh, four years, and then, as we shall hear, he spent the next eight years in forests in Southeast Asia. <coughs> this is Richard Spruce, the, the third. <coughs> Same background, you know, left school at, in his case, 14, I think. His father was a primary school teacher in, in rural Yorkshire, <coughs> and Spruce was supposed to follow in his footsteps. <coughs> but on the way to school, uh, he, he got very interested in plants, and particularly mosses and liverworts, these tiny little plants that look, look shaped slightly like a human liver. <coughs> but it's a very primitive plant. It doesn't have any pollen or, or blossoms. <coughs> but anyway, he loved them. And um, <coughs> Spruce had, had they all, all three were pretty cheeky about it. Even in their teens, they were getting stuff published. And he, he got some papers published on new s species of moss and new to the United Kingdom. <coughs> And that had caught the attention of, of Sir William Hooker at Kew and his great friend, George Bentham. So th they sent Walt Spruce off for a year of collecting in the Pyrenees, which he did beautifully. <laughs> and then they, they'd, all, they'd read the, the letters that Samuel Stevens had got published from Bates and Wallace. And uh, Hooker said to Spruce, look, um, why don't you go and join these two? They're obviously in a, a very fruitful part of the world. And so, and then Benson made him the marvelous offer. Benson said, look, 
Bentham was, was rich and, a, and a, a very fine botanist. He said that I'll create a syndicate of other rich botanical collectors and they'll each put in an annual sum. And, but you then send back preferably new, new material for their, for their collection cases. And uh, it started with 11 uh, people in the syndicate and as the years went by and uh, Spruce's reputation grew, it finally ended up with thir 30. Um, and Bentham got the money out of the, out of the syndicate, above all, got it out to Spruce in, in the Amazon. Um, which was all done, they, they had they were good, a, honest agents in Berlin, and then, then but somehow they got it up the rivers, because there was no currency. You, you, you had to just take bales of cloth and uh, cachaça and stuff. To <laughs> but um, but the, so th this was what really drove Spruce. It, it, it took me a while to suddenly dawned on me that because Spruce, um, when he got out, um, he, he went out in the following year, 1849, in the same little boat that the others had gone in. And um, he, he very soon after he got there, he, he wrote back uh, to a friend, the largest river in the world runs through the largest forest. Fancy if you can, two millions of square miles of forest, that's his underlining, uninterrupted, save by the streams that traverse it. This is actually spot on, it's uh, very accurate. The, uh, the Amazon, as we know, is by far the largest river system in the world, and it's in the middle of by far the largest expanse of tropical rainforest. Spruce's love of plants was pure and passionate. He confessed in another letter, I, li I like to look on plants as sentient beings which live and enjoy their lives, which beautify the earth during life and after death may adorn my herbarium. <coughs> and then he, because he loved every sort of plant, and it, what, what dawned on me is that he, he, his game plan was to spend half a year, a year, in one location. He started in Santarem, then he was in Orbidosh, and then he was in Manaus and Manakiri. And then he, he and Wallace had become great friends. They only were together for about a fortnight, but they were friends for life. And Wallace somehow got a message down, down the Rio Negro um, to Spruce saying, you, know, you ought to come up here, it's, it's fantastic uh, hunting grounds. So in, in the year after Wallace, he, uh, Spruce went up. But he, he, he loved everything. He loved palm trees. He's got this. He, he later in life wrote a, a monumental book on the palms of the Amazon. But of course, what was driving him to, to move on was this syndicate. Because he, he, he said he, he's only collecting things that he was pretty sure were, un, were unknown to him and were unknown to European botanists. And of course, he, 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 Bates ended up spending 11 years. Spruce spent 15 years in South America. Um, and I think in that course of that, he was in about 12 different botanical realms. So he, he sent about 7,000 species of plant, and a great, great many of those. He, he would, gave the first description of them and named them. Um, but he, as, a, as I said earlier, one of his favorites was these tiny liverworts. Um, he, he rather apologetically said, it's true that the hepatici, that's their Latin name for liver, the, the hepatici have hardly as yet yielded any substance of medicinal value to man, nor are they good for food. But although man cannot torture them to his uses or abuses, they are infinitely useful where God has placed them, and they are at the least useful to and beautiful in themselves. Surely the primary motive for every individual existence. Now, I, you, you'll notice I've 
hardly, I, I'm really so excited by their achievements. I very rarely mention the hardships. That <coughs> they all had lots of adventures, but they made light of them. <coughs> but I re will read you a couple of quotes from Spruce. <coughs> he said, I've, I've once been stung by wasps. You know, I've been stung by wasps, I suppose, hundreds of times. Once very badly, having above 20 stings in my head and face alone. Yet I've always admired their beauty and ingenuity and heroic ferocity. Uh, which of us could have been stung 20 times on our face and admired the heroic ferocity of the wasp that did it? And then um, also occasionally he would run into a nest of tokandira ants. Have you ever been stung by them? Um, not nice. <coughs> His feet were covered in stings from these long monsters. And he wrote, for hours, my, my sufferings were indescribable. I can only liken the pain to that of a hundred thousand nettle stings. His feet and hands trembled as if from palsy, and he was drenched in perspiration and wanted to vomit. <coughs> and on another occasion, he wrote, he wrote also, it has several times happened to myself, when deep in the forest and quite alone, to be unable to find my track. It's a rather painful moment when one becomes convinced that the way is irrevocably lost. Let the reader try to picture to himself what it is to be lost or benighted in the vast extent of the forest-clad Amazon Valley. I can sympathize that I found myself lost in, you know, on the upper Riri Riri. <coughs> and uh, you know if you keep going the wrong direction, that's the end of you if you're in a, in a completely unexplored bit of forest. So you have to just, you're under a tree, and you go out from that tree and back around the compass until you finally find a broken sapling or some evidence of where your trail is. But as I say, the, the, these guys were real explorers. They, 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 uh, they didn't realize quite how, how tough they were or how much they were achieving, and they never, ever complained about it, because they loved it. They were, that's why they stayed so long. Now, um, Spruce also got up to the, the wild pairs, to those wonderful Tukano and, and, uh, tribes, and um, he, he drew the chief of, of the Tariana at, at Yawarate. Uh, and I think this is probably the first portrait of, it's not, not, he wasn't nearly as good an artist as Wallace, but, but I think this is the first portrait of a known Indian in Brazilian history. Um, and then uh, <coughs> all the people in, in his family, and, and how they, they so liked this, so they all came and <coughs> try, tried to get, get him to do their portraits, which he did. He did a whole series of portraits. <coughs> now, this next one, this is not, not nice. Um, these Englishmen, because uh, every now and then they metaphorically lift a stone and find nasty things going on, and they, they bumped into some, some nasty behavior which no Brazilian would have written about. <coughs> when, he, when he was at Maravitanas, which is the, the frontier fort between <coughs> Brazil and Venezuela on, on the Rio Negro, the, the uh, com commandant, <coughs> uh, I, I enslaving of Indians was illegal. It had been since the middle of the 18th century. But they, they found a, a sort of a nasty little loophole of kidnapping children. And then they say, oh, these are orphans. And they were sent down to Manaus for, to be slaves. I don't know whether sexual slaves, but anyway, household slaves. And these are two little girl, uh, Huptu, Maku girls. And uh, Huptu are uh, entirely, they're the last of the entirely nomadic forest peoples. They never build a hut or, or a village. They're, they're constantly on the move in the forest. And these two poor little girls have been plucked out of that, out of their families in the forest. And there they were in the fort of Marabitanas, ready to be sent down to Manaus. <coughs> and th their, their friends in Manaus would say, send me a couple of girls, you know, and you know, I'll pay you. So, um, well, uh, he, he reckoned one, one was about 12 and the other about 8. Uh, 
not surprisingly, rather. <coughs> but um, I'm glad. So there wasn't too much of the, the, these nasty things they wrote. Most of the time, they, they, they got on very well with the few Brazilians that they, they met. <coughs> this is the um, uh, <coughs> granted outcrop of Cucuy. It was very near that frontier between <coughs> Venezuela and um, Brazil. <coughs> Spruce, of course, tried to get up. He got most of the way up it, again, collecting new new plants. <coughs> and he was able to look out over that. This forest is very flat up there, as I'm sure a lot of us know. <coughs> and the, he, but with his expert botanical eye, he, he could look at the forest canopy and tell what type of forest was under it. Uh, it because it's so flat up there, the mm, the watershed is, is, is hardly a watershed, uh, and, and uh, I'm sure you all know the, the Orinoco flows down and divides, and about a third of the river doesn't flow on up north, westwards into the Caribbean, it, but it it meanders down and joins the Rio Negro, and f comes across into the Amazon system, and that. Link is the Casiquiare uh, Canal. It's uh, actually a river, <coughs> but uh, Spruce went up there. Of course, Humboldt. It was one of the things that attracted Humboldt to this part of the world. He wanted to. It's it's the la <coughs> largest link between two great river systems in the world. Uh, but again, the Spruce. You see, he was looking for new, new plants all the time. And he was rather disappointed that the Casiquiare, did the, the the vegetation on the Upper Orinoco wasn't that different to the vegetation o on the upper Rio Negro and the Guainia. <coughs> and then he went down the Orinoco to the Maipures Rapids and did a lot of fine collecting there. <coughs> uh, and this is a river called the Pasimoni, or in its higher reaches, it's the Barrier, which flows out of the Pico da Neblina <coughs> into the Casiquiare Canal. And Spruce explored it, um, the way Wallace had notched up a explored river in the upper wild pairs. <coughs> Spruce also had an explored river to his credit. Um, this is what it looks like now. I, I haven't been up it, I've been on it. But um, it's it's just the same now as it was in Spruce's day. It's, it's very beautiful and, and very empty. Um, this is what their riverbank uh, camps were like. It's actually photoed by Koch Grunberg, Theodore Koch Grunberg, a few decades later, but exactly the same part of the world. <laughs> how, am I, how am I doing for time? Am I? It's very bad. Hmm? It's about 1045. I could tell you a, a little story about this. Uh, all right. Uh, this is one of the few really nasty things that happened to Spruce. He'd had a, a t terribly violent attack of malaria o on, the, on the Orinoco and uh, staggered back to San Carlos de Rio Negro. And he was still very, very weak. But he, he'd by then been collecting for three years up, up in the mm, upper Rio Negro, and he had to get his great collections back and package them and send them off to, in, to the syndicate in Britain. <laughs> anyway, one. He, he got to get he, he Spruce because he got a bit more money than the others fr from this syndicate. He actually had his own. He bought an old boat and had it modified for himself. Um, so he had his own boat, <coughs> and he'd scraped up a, 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 a team of Indians from San Carlos, of Venezuelan Indians. <coughs> and the first night out, they they stopped at the riverbank Sitio of of the. The crew of five of the mm -hmm. leader of that, <coughs> and Spru Spruce was very, very ill still. And, you know, if you had malaria, you, you, you are anemic after it. <coughs> and he'd also, uh, <coughs> they'd given him a bit of rotten tapir meat, and so he had bad diarrhea. <coughs> so he was lying in his hammock and in a pretty bad way. <coughs> but <coughs> all, all three of them were fantastic linguists. They got obviously perfect Portuguese, but they, they also learnt lingua geral, and, and Spruce had learnt Arawak, the, the sort of Arawak spoken by the, um, I guess it was Barrier 
people in, in San Carlos. And he was lying there, almost delirious, with, and uh, uh, listening to them getting drunk on cachaça or a Venezuelan equivalent. And he suddenly realized that they were talking about him. And there was a nasty son-in-law who was not part of his crew, but, but a rather more... Um, uh, I won't use the word civilized, but who would rattled around a bit more in Venezuelan. And he was egging the others on. He was saying, look, this, this guy is very rich because he had all these boxes of his pressed plants and they thought it was trade goods. Uh, and he, he's got no family. He's very ill. Why don't we just steal it and, and steal his stuff? And, and then they got more and more drunk and and then they said, well, why don't we just kill him? Because he, he's very ill. He practically died of malaria. And if we go back and say, well, he, he popped off and, and we had to chuck him in the river. So um, he overheard them planning to, and, uh, how, and they were, they were going to go up the Isana and hide there for a while and then, then go back to San Carlos and say, well, we're very sorry, but he, he, um, he died. So um, he, 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 with his diarrhea, he had to keep getting out of his hammock and going to the forest. And, and uh, he could hear that. And they, they, they decided that they'd wait for him to get back. And as soon as he fell asleep, they'd just go and smother him and, and kill him that way. So, he, so it, another time he went out to have a crap in the forest. But he didn't. He went down to his canoe. And... Arranged his plants as a sort of bulwark, and got his gun, and and spent the whole night. And he heard them saying, you know, "It was because pitch dark, as, as you know, in, in a, a forest." Is where is he? Why did he come back? And it, and, uh, and he managed to stay awake all night. And this is a sick, sick man. But anyway, uh, the following morning, uh, nothing nothing was said about it. But but he made sure that that son-in-law didn't come on his crew. And then when he, when he got two days down the river, the first footage was Gia. He, he got rid of that crew, and even though he'd paid them for all the way to Manas. Um, so, uh, but that, that was a rarity. Uh, on the whole, they, they had very, very, not very, very few disagreeable things happen to them. <coughs> when he got down to Manas, the... the suddenly uh, transportation was revolutionized by a, a steamer, a steamer heavily subsidized by the Brazilian government. And it, it made the run from Belém to Manaus. Manaus, by the way, it, it was a, a village of four and a half thousand people at that time, long before the r rubber boom. My, my village in Gloucestershire is four and a half thousand. Um, but th this, th this isn't the actual um, steamer, but it's exactly the same. And it, it, once a month it came up to Manaus, and then once a quarter it went on up into into Peru. Mm -hmm. So he he'd been corresponding with a, a Spanish gentleman in, in a little tiny town in the north of Peru called Taraputo. So he decided to take the steamer up past I Iquitos didn't exist then, but uh, past Iquitos. Uh, to Nauta, and then three months up the Wayaga. Mm. The Taraputo is extreme left-hand, bottom left corner of this. He, he actually, uh, I think I can point to this. Oh yeah, yeah. So there's the uh, where the where Wallace did his. The, there's the Cafetiari Canal, joining the Orinoco. With the, with the Rio Negro. There's a Kukui, uh, granite outcrop. Anyway, he, so Bruce had brought his collection down to Manaus and sent them off to England and took the steamer up to, to Nauta. Anyway, uh, and then, then well, it was beyond the Kilos. Yeah, there is Nauta. And then up the um, Wayaga uh, to Tarapoto, uh, where he had a, a very, very happy year and a half of 
botanizing in, in all those hills. That's his little hut that his friend got for him at the edge of Tarapoto, the little garden. <coughs> and he was bliss blissfully happy sending back yet another pioneering uh, botanical collection <coughs> and, and doing excursions into all these hills. And, and then um, in 1857, his, he had two friends, again, middle-aged. I don't know quite why. They, they never seemed to make friends with their own age group. But there was the Majorcan Spaniard, Momi, and, and another Peruvian. And these guys were, were traders, and they wanted to trade in Panama hats, which were all the rage then. And uh, as we all know, uh, Panama hats don't come from Panama. They come from Ecuador. So they decided to, to go to Ecuador. And they, and they took three canoes, you know, one canoe for the Spaniard, one for the Peruvian, and one for uh, Spruce. Spruce decided he, he'd done enough in, around Tarapoto and said he, he'd go with them. This is a, a modern boat with an outboard, but you, you get the picture. They, they went, it, it turned out to be a really tough journey. It took them three months down the Wayaga, up a bit of the Marañón, up the Pastasa, up the Bobonasa. And in, in the lower pastas was, was um, dangerous with Hivero um, country, who, who were, and the, the crew would only rest on on islands. <coughs> anyway, halfway up the river, they were <coughs> in the territory of the Andoa people, roughly well on the Peruvian and Ecuadorian boundary. <coughs> and Spruce saw the shaman. Y um, instructing uh, boys in ayahuasca, a hallucinogenic vine. And Spruce being, by now, he, he, already, he was a consummate botanist before he set out, but by now he was one of the world's finest botanists. And he knew, in, instantly knew that this was the same plant he'd seen being used on the middle Orinoco, where they called it carpi, and by those peoples on the, on the Waupes, where they called it Cadana. It's also, he didn't know it, but it's also called Yaje in, in, in Colombia. <coughs> and it's, it's a powerful hallucinogen. <coughs> this is, um, Spruce had first described it uh, on the Orinoco and, and sent, this is his herbarium specimen he sent back, which is in a collection at Kew. <coughs> in Kew, Spruce's material is, is gold standard. Whenever a consignment would come in from him, practically the whole r botanical gardens would come and see these treasures unwrapped. And you can see he'd named it um, Banisteria Carpi. You can see this rather beautiful handwriting in the bottom left. <coughs> and then he, he did some very interesting studies of the use of hallucinogens. <coughs> he, he realized that it wasn't given to patients the way we give a medicament. It was solely used for the shaman to, to inspire him. This is my photograph of a, a Yanomami shaman, uh, actually not, not using, using Epena. But he's got his head thrown back, and he's exercising, the, the sucking the illness out of the patient lying in the hammock. And he also, um, quite a few of us had this, uh, he, he blow, blows the up in our, up your nostrils, which I, I've had that done. And uh, you think you can solve any, th any problem in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it wears off <laughs> after an hour or two. <laughs> anyway, so then uh, uh, he, he did much more uh, study of hallucinogens, uh, particularly in Nyopo, uh, Parika, uh, and... Um, and, and you, you obviously you noted that some tribes used them intensively. Other tribes didn't touch them. And, and it, it records the different ways different peoples use, use the hallucinogens. This is, like the other two, this was disinterested scientific research. <coughs> when he got up, he was in more botanical realms on, on the eastern flanks of the Andes. He was in what a lovely montane cloud forest and mist forest. <coughs> he made his way down 
incredibly rickety 150 foot trunk tree trunks into a little valley which he said was the mossiest place on earth that he'd ever seen and it's just wild with excitement at all these different mosses <coughs> and then he got up into, into the Altiplano or in the in, Intramontane <coughs> valleys in Ecuador and <coughs> based himself in different towns like Ambato and uh, Rio Bamba and Banos and Quito for a while <coughs> and in the next year and a half he did no less than 60 uh, botanical excursions. Th th this was an area which was not virgin territory for botanists, but, but he was still finding new material to send back. And then in 1859, his life changed. because he, he got a, a, a consi an assignment to work for the India office in, in Britain, collecting chinchona trees the seeds and saplings of chinchona. Chinchona is, a, is quite a large family of trees, but mm, five or six species of chinchona in their bark have quinine, the alkaloid, which brings down malarial fever. That had been known to Indians for centuries, but, uh, but they told the Jesuits, and the Jesuits had, had, had a monopoly of, they were smart businessmen, and they, they, they had a monopoly. And <laughs> Jesuits have been kicked out by now, but, but it was still a monopoly of, of the Andean countries. <laughs> and a young British, uh, I'm calling him a civil servant, but Clements Markham, <laughs> he, he'd been a midship, a young midshipman on a Royal Navy ship and had got to Peru <laughs> and fallen in love with Peru. And he, he did a very impressive journey right deep into Madre de Dios and Tarapoto and and had seen the Calisaya species of, of chinchona being collected. <coughs> and he, he wrote a book about his young travels in Peru. <coughs> but he was now working for the India office and reading all these reports of malaria in the, all the British colonies in Africa and, and the Asia. <coughs> so he, he decided he'd try and go and get the chinchona trees out of the Andes. Um, he, he, an amazing fellow. He, he, he gave himself a crash course in, in everything that he could find out about. And the, the Royal Geographical Society, is, we've still got the, all his notebooks of his learning about Chinchona. <coughs> anyway, he, he himself went to try to get the Calisaya uh, species of Chinchona out of, out of the Madre de Dios in Peru. And then he sent another British botanist to northern Peru to get the gray bark. Uh, they both got kicked out by the Peru Peruvians, realized what they were up to, and sent them packing. Uh, Markham managed to smuggle a few saplings out, but they, they all died. Anyway, he, he, he wanted someone to try and get the red bark um, species of chinchona f from Ecuador. <coughs> and um, so they asked the people at Kew and, and um, Hooker and Bentham said, well, well, the finest botanist we got in the field it happens to be in Ecuador as we speak, Richard's Booth. So um, he, they got this, he got the into office to authorize a small stipend. And they, the Markham dropped the letter off with the British consul in Guayaquil and it was conveyed up to Spruce in the mountains. It's the first time he'd had a job, uh, if you don't count the syndicate. Um, <coughs> but the, the Chinchona forests were owned by Ecuadorians who were making money out of, out of the quinine. <coughs> so he went to the, the two, two in particular, and they, he said, can I collect seeds and saplings? And they said, no, no way. Well, the same as the Peruvians. And then, but they liked him. They knew him. And he was the epitome of an English gentleman. He was tall, but he and Wallace were both six footers or more, actually. And he was dignified, but, but charming and a lovely sense of humor and great integrity. He was the epitome of what they regard as an English gentleman. So they said, all right, to you, Don Ricardo, okay, you can do it. They, they made him pay. He paid $450. But they then told their bark collectors to help him 
And they said, you can't touch the bark. I mean, you didn't want the bark, but okay, you can collect seeds and saplings. So, that, so he, being spruce, he, he devoted the next nearly two years to this and, and went into it with incredible intensity. First of all, he got to know the bark collectors. This is one of their camps. And you can see that they've felled the trees in a very profligate way to get at the bark. And uh, so Spruce was rather horrified to find that the, these great forests of Chinchona almost all had been, been cut down. But occasionally a, a tree had grown out of the, the root, uh, out of the stump. And those little trees were big enough to produce seeds. So he was able to collect several thousand, several hundred thousand seeds and he experimented, he sun-dried them, but it, he was experimenting to make sure he could get them to grow again. It's like Kew Gardens have got the Millennium Seed Bank where they're trying to gather seeds from all the plants in the world and then bring them to life if they need to. Um, I won't go into it all, but he, anyway, he very proudly in, in October of 1860, he sent down 200,000 um, chinchona, red bark chinchona <coughs> seeds to Waiakil. And then M Markham had very, very cleverly realized Spruce was a superb botanist, but he wasn't a gardener. So th they'd sent, Q sent a gardener out to help him propagate these. <coughs> and they, they managed to get about 30 of them to grow into little seedlings. And they were sent off in Wardian cases so they could go on. Because there's no Panama Canal, no Suez Canal. But anyway, they, they got to Kew and then they got out to India And in, in 1861. By 1865, there were a quarter of a million chinchona trees growing in Assam and in Kerala and, and Ceylon. So it, it saved a, a lot of misery and lives. How are we doing? Okay, well, I'll, 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 I'll wind up pretty quickly. Um, that's, that's the way he was doing the collecting and down to work. He then went on to do two more botanical realms. He, he, went, he did some collecting in the northern Peruvian mm, carob, uh, semi-dry um, prosopis woods. This is Richard Evan Schultes, who, as we all know, is one of the greatest tropical botanists of the Amazon of the, of the uh, 20th century. And um, Wade Davis, I'm sorry, you also probably all know, um, who was um, Schultes' pupil and, and wrote the wonderful biographical book, what One River, about him. He said that Professor Schultes, you, you seem to have modeled your life on Richard Spruce. Was that unconscious or subconscious? And Schulte said, no, neither. It was deliberate, because I so admire Richard Spruce. And he wrote about him. Sorry, uh, I think I left it behind. No, never mind. He, but he, he wrote um, Spruce's... Um, Biogeographic collections are, are, are some of the most remarkable that have ever been. And then Schultes wrote, undoubtedly, Richard Spruce is one of the greatest explorers of all times. Full stop. Um, no one's ever heard of him, but, <laughs> but his, his fame was revived by, by Schultes. Um, uh, I'll wrap up pretty quickly now. Uh, <laughs> this, this is Wallace, who... who after his four years in the Amazon, where he learned all about collecting in rainforest, he then went eight, spent eight years in Southeast Asia and what's now Indonesia, and, and achieved fame in that, including in 1858 he sent an essay. He, he was lying. He he's had malaria, um, as we know, and it was, it was recurring, and he was lying there in his bed, and um, it suddenly dawned on him that he they'd read Malthus. The human race is growing too fast, but it will always be held down by disease and famine and uh, warfare. 
but he thought, well, the natural world is spewing out seeds and eggs and in huge quantities, but almost all of it gets gobbled up. But the few that don't are the fittest, are the ones who can run faster or hide better or hunt better or fly higher or, <coughs> or camouflage better. <coughs> so he sent that essay to Darwin. He knew Darwin was working on, on, on this subject. <coughs> this is a modern uh, imaginary scene of Darwin getting the Wallace's paper, and there's his two friends, Joseph Hooker on the right, and Charles Lyell, the ge great geologist in the middle. And w w Darwin hadn't yet started writing the great book. He'd been gathering data for 10 years, and he was sort of gobsmacked. He, he, he said, you know, Mr. Wallace, he, he, he said, he's, his paragraphs are the same as mine. <laughs> anyway, they, they I don't want to go into all of the details, but they, I think they both behaved like perfect Victorian gentlemen. N neither ever claimed for a moment priority. They just felt it was a complete happy coincidence that they both stumbled on the same theory. <coughs> and I sent my last chapter, uh, uh, David Attenborough, who's a great admirer of Wallace, uh, as are many people. I was talking to him about it. And, and I sent him my last chapter, which is what became of them all after the Amazon. <coughs> and David, is, and David is, he, every television company is trying to get him before he, 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 he was, this was last year when he was at 88. He immediately sent me back a lovely, long typewritten letter. He doesn't do emails. Um, and he, he said, your description of the relations between Darwin and Wallace are marvelous and the most heartwarming I've ever read. Uh, uh, I, won't, I won't go into the but but they were. Anyway, then, then Darwin got busy and, and wrote the great book, and then it was published by John Murray in the following year, <coughs> that which was 1859, which was when Bates came back from his 11 years. He was, he'd gone out at 23, he was now 34. <coughs> and um, Darwin was, uh, of course, he immediately, saw the point in the theory. And there were very few people who had 11 years of non-stop collecting under their belts. So Darwin was very pleased to have this uh, brilliant young man on the, on the, um, and became quite a father figure to him, introduced him to John Murray and told him how to go about writing this book that, that you had on your <laughs> table last night, <coughs> which was a great success, immediately sold out. <coughs> and now all three of them, I'm pretty sure in all those years in the Amazon, they were celibate because there were very few women around and uh, you, you didn't mess with Indian women and the, the Portuguese and Brazilians kept their women pretty secluded. And none, none of them would have seen this trio as uh, eligible catches for their daughters. So, so anyway, Bates went back to his family in Leicester and, and pretty promptly got the, the very pretty young daughter of the local butcher pregnant and they had a baby and then he married her. He, he, wrote, he wrote to Darwin and, um, and uh, in, in the marriage certificate she could only put an X, she couldn't write. It actually was a, a wonderful marriage, a very happy marriage. And, but he, he wrote to Darwin, Mrs. Bates is an ordinary woman, there you have it. <laughs> anyway, uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the Royal Geographical Society by then it was in a mess. It had been a, in existence for over 30 years, but run by amateurs, honorary secretaries. Mm -hmm. And they decided it was time they had a paid chief executive. So they told Darwin uh, and other people, and Darwin said to Bates, look, you, you've got a young family and no job. Why don't you go for this? So, so Bates applied, and his two referees were Charles Darwin and John Murray, and he got the job. Uh, we, we now know he was the only applicant, but, but he, he then ran the RGS brilliantly for, for just short of 30 years. He was still on, at work when he died in, in 1892, and I was the fifth paid chief executive that I had this portrait of, of Bates above my desk for my 21 years. But he, he really made... And Surprisingly, uh, Clements Markham, the, the, the young chap who'd got Spruce to bring the Chinchona, he was the, for 25 of those years, he was the honorary secretary. 
and he and Bates m m made a team. And those two, when they started, our Jess was a shambles. It was, it was broke and nothing was happening. By the end, they, it was the premier geographical society in the world, thanks to Henry Walter Bates and, and Clemens Markham. Um, Wallace, meanwhile, had he, he was a sort of grand old man of science. Wallace, in his personal bibliography of books, papers, articles, he'd written and published under his name, 750 titles. I've, I've got about 120, you've probably got much more than that, but 750 in the days when there weren't all that many journals around. And all, all three of them got quite a bit of distinctions. They got medals and <laughs> both Bates and Wallace were f fellows of the Royal Society, which is very high. Um, they were presidents of things like the Linnaean Society, entomological. And, and then Wallace got the, the highest accolade of all. He was given the Order of Merit, um, which is uh, uh, only 22 th the top people. And by then he was, it was 1908, he was an old man living in Dorset. <coughs> and when they told him, he said, what are they giving this to an old socialist like me for? <coughs> and he wouldn't go up to Buckingham Palace and get, he asked them to send it down to him. But, uh, <coughs> And they all, all three got honorary doctorates. Uh, Bates was made a, a knight of Brazil by the Emperor Dom Pedro II when he came to visit Queen Victoria because his book had done so much to tell the world about Brazil. <coughs> so all in all, n not bad for three youngsters who left school at 13 and had no money and no influence behind them. Thank you. you know that the books are available the book is available here outside now I have uh, w there may be some questions I have one I would like to know uh, John, where is all this material is this collected in one place or this is yeah, yeah that's a good question I of course nowadays uh, Tom and knows only too well anyone collecting in Brazil lodges the first example in, in a Brazilian museum yeah, sorry. The, the, the oh market. yeah, sorry. But of course, the, 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 there were no museums in the Amazon, so I'm afraid they, they didn't leave any material in Brazil. <coughs> but they did leave the, the identification of a huge mass of, of new species. <coughs> uh, a lot of their mat material is in Kew and the Natural History Museum, but the rest, of course, uh, St Stevens was selling the gentlemen all over England and, and, and continental Europe. And then, um, so quite a lot got dispersed. But um, in both, the, in, in Kew, you can certainly see a lot of, lot of spruces in, in the herbarium. In the Natural History Museum, <coughs> most of Bates' material got fed into the collection. So it, it, but there are still some panels of, of his own collecting. And a, a friend of mine there, when I, a couple of lectures I've given in London, he, he's brought along a, a, a panel of, of Bates's bugs. <laughs> um, so that's, where, that's the easiest place to see them. Thank you. Any questions? I think we would have. If not, well, I <coughs> would like to thank you, John, very, very much for this wonderful lecture. And uh, uh, I think... Uh, if you're interested, the books are outside, and I think John will be glad to sign the book for you. Thank you very much for being here.